Let's work through an example of finding a magnetic field using Ampere's law. We'll look at a long straight wire that has a non-uniform current running through it with a current density J being some constant C times the radial distance little r. Big R will represent the radius of the wire itself, which has a circular cross-section. Since the current density is a function only of R, we have a cylindrically symmetric situation, and we expect that we'll be able to use Ampere's law to solve for the B field. The magnetic field lines made by such a current will point around in circular loops. To find the magnetic field at some point, we draw an Amperian loop that includes that point such that the loop will overlap nicely with the field lines. This overlap ensures that any piece of the loop, which is what a DL is, will be parallel to the B field. And if B and DL are always parallel, B dot DL gives B times DL. Since the loop is centered on a cylindrically symmetric current, the B fields at different points on the loop are guaranteed to be of the same magnitude, meaning B is constant all along the loop. And we can pull it outside the integral. Integral dL gives L, which is the length of the Amperian loop, 2 pi times little r. So now the left-hand side of Ampere's law is dealt with. Next up is to handle the right side by calculating the current enclosed by the loop. I'm going to redraw the situation with a cross-sectional view. Current is a current density times an area, so J, A, and I are related by the following. A little bit of current DI comes from looking at some differential chunk of cross-sectional area and multiplying it by the current density. So how are we going to break up that circular cross-section into dA's? We want dA's along which J is constant. So since J depends only on R, breaking the area into a bunch of concentric rings should do the trick. Each ring has perimeter 2 pi R and width dR, so we take length times width to get the area. And we integrate up all the dI's to get the total current. Now for the bounds. I'll shade the region that's actually occupied by current. The current begins at r equals zero and ends at big R. So we crank it out and put it all together. That's the B at any point outside the wire. Notice that what we got was the same thing we would have gotten for a uniform current but with a little extra work involved in getting the total I in terms of J. This is a common result. The field made by any cylindrically symmetric current, as long as you're outside that current, ends up looking just like the field made by a long, straight, uniform wire. Now, what if we're inside the wire? What field do we get then? Here's the same situation, but the point of interest is inside the wire, so I've drawn my Amperian loop so as to include that point. The steps involving the left-hand side of Ampere's law follow exactly as before, giving us the same basic equation for B. But there'll be a small difference when we go to calculate I enclosed. DI is still JDA, and JDA are the same, though I'll write them in terms of our primes instead of ours. I'll also shade in where the enclosed current actually lives. We don't enclose all of the current in the wire this time. It stops short at little r. So I figure that information into the bounds and crank it all out. So that's our B inside. It's qualitatively different from the B outside equation, being linear in r instead of depending on 1 over r. And that's how you find B fields with Ampere's law. As a reminder, every step we took had a correspondent in Gauss's law, which, if you already know Gauss's law, can make it a lot faster to learn Ampere's law.